Good morning, everyone. Ah, that works. Welcome to our breakout session at the uh, Midwest High School SIG conference. We're going to be talking today about um, collaborative learning opportunities. And I believe you'll find we mostly are talking about communities of practice. Um, you'll see it up on the slide as Tori's uh, introduction. I think that's the term I'm going to be using, and you may end up as well. So while the conversation is about um, professional learning, collaborative learning, uh, I think we're probably going to focus on a specific form of that called communities of practice. And so we'll get into that in a minute. If you are in the wrong room, we won't be offended if you have to stand up and and step out. So welcome, glad to see so many people here. I'm Cersei Stumbo with Westwind Education Policy, and I'm a consultant in the National High School Center. And um, we've got a great set of conversations set for this morning to talk about how we can engage and organize and design uh, communities of practice for school improvement. Um, I'm going to just do a real quick um, introductions of our presenters, and then I'm going to let you all say a little bit about yourselves and, and what you do in the context of the work we're going. So to my right is Elizabeth Grant with the U.S. Department of Education, and to her right is Tori Sirks with the American Institutes for Research. And we're going to start with Liz uh, providing some overview of what the U.S. Department of Education has been doing in the way of communities of practice, what they're looking forward to doing maybe a little bit about what she hopes to hear from the conversation today. And then Tori will share some great background information. And we've got a little table exercise that we'll have folks engage in. Um, so we hope to make this interactive. Uh, a couple housekeeping. If you have a question or want to make a comment, they are audio recording the session. And so they need you to speak into the microphone. Unfortunately, it's a wired mic in the back of the room. So we'll see how we can make this work. Um, if, if you can and you have a question, go ahead and walk to the back of the room. That'll be our signal that you have a question. And then you can speak right into the microphone and it will be caught by audio. If that's slowing things down, we might ask our um, room moderator to stand in the back and just repeat the question for you. So we'll see how it goes if you're OK with being a little flexible with the schedule there. OK. Well, with that, I think I'll go ahead and turn it over to Liz and let you share a few, few thoughts. Good morning, everybody. Um, I work in the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education for the Assistant Secretary, Thelma Melendez. And our office is, runs a number of the grant programs that filter down to your states and to your districts and hopefully to your schools, um, particularly Title I, which um, houses the SIG program. And so in my role there in the Assistant Secretary's office, we've been working um, trying to figure out some ways to provide technical assistance to support your work. And uh, we don't have a lot of funding to do this. Congress gave us a great deal of money to pass along to states and districts and uh, left none of it for us to hold and try and provide support and technical assistance. So we've been trying to cobble together some ways to make that happen to um, address the needs that we're hearing out in the field. One of them is to work with the comprehensive centers, which have been great in, in trying to capture as much knowledge as they can and then producing some things like these conferences. This is the third of four conferences on SIG around the country. We have one next week focused on rural schools, which will be held in Denver. And um, so far, they've been terrific and have provided a lot of opportunities. But the one thing I wanted to share with you that we are doing is um, creating an online community of practice, a uh, professional learning community. I guess there's some certain terminology around this. Ours will be a learning community. Uh, we're going to have it up and running hopefully in a month. It turns out to be pretty complex to create these things online. But what we wanted to do is to provide a central resource for you to go to to gather information and get expert knowledge and some resources that can help you. And we particularly want to facilitate networking uh, between principals, between district leaders, between state leaders, and then up and down the chain as well from state to district to schools. Uh, one of the reasons we want to do that is that um, we've learned a lot so far in the last year from the Race to the Top grantees. You know that there are 12 states that received those Race to the Top grants, which was a great deal of money. But it also came with a great deal of responsibility. And they are being asked to do things as states that have never been asked of them before. And nobody knows the right answer. 
They don't know how to get it done. So what that means is the old TA model of a federal office or a state office bringing in an expert and the expert sharing their wisdom and then people going away and trying to figure out how it fits isn't working because there aren't experts that know how to do the work. They don't know how to transform a state office from one that's based on compliance to one that moves to TA support. So what's been happening over the course of this last year is that our sophistication and understanding of what needs to happen in technical assistance has grown, and it needs to grow a great deal more, I'm sure. But uh, one of the primary lessons we've learned is that it is only through talking with each other and coming up with the answers together that we're going to find the solutions to those challenges that we face. This is the big lesson from what we've been learning on the focused work with the RTT states, it's certainly the big lesson for SIG. This work is complex, and as Carl said, Carl Harris, the Deputy Assistant Secretary, said this morning, it is hard. And I haven't yet, like you, heard the right answer on what can be done. And it's only going to come from you talking with each other and sharing your experiences. And as in the RTT network, they States are now starting to take the lead on webinars and saying, hey, we have something we'd love to share, we'd love to get feedback on, we want to interact with other states around this and hear what they're doing and what their context is. So that's the kind of thing we want to try and set up for you around the school improvement grants and turning around schools and particularly high schools. So we're going to have a high school focus with this. Um, over the next few months, we'll try and have some conversations set up, some webinars, and some ways to interact with each other to share what you're doing so we can get some greater wisdom and knowledge about how to turn around the schools and um, hopefully some greater success. So my role here is not to provide the expertise and information that you'll hear from the two um, sitting here next to me, Tori and Cersei, but rather to listen to what your concerns are and your challenges are and uh, try and learn from that. So even if we don't have a chance in, at, as we're sitting in these seats at the moment to, to get that conversation going deeply, I would love to talk to you at any time about what you need to get the work done. What could be provided to you? What information, what expertise, what linkages, what networks could be provided to you to help um, move that along as we're developing our plan for providing technical assistance to you. So I want to just thank you for being here at the conference. Thank you for being at this session and um, let you know how much I admire the work. I, um, I spent a lot of years in schools but never had to turn one around. So I'm impressed with what you're doing and, and hope to learn from, from this session and from the next two days. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't share is that she's really been quite central, I think, in even helping to organize this event. So I hope that um, as you see how helpful the event is, you'll have a chance to thank Liz <laughs> as well. We're going to switch around and um, let Tori come and share um, her uh, experiences and insights around effective communities of practice. Um, while she's getting set up there, uh, let's just see who's in the room. Okay, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Um, well, my name is Tori Sirks. I'm a technical assistance consultant with the Great Lakes East Comprehensive Center. And for those of you that might not be familiar with comprehensive centers, we're one of 16 regional centers funded by the U.S. Department of Ed, and we work specifically with state education agencies. And for Great Lakes East, we work with Michigan, Ohio, and Indiana. So do I have any Michigan, Ohio, or Indiana here? <laughs> All right, well, I'll try not to play favorites. Um, since I work with those states, but thank you. And what I'm going to talk about today is really about how we're using um, communities of practice and effective communities of practice um, through our technical assistance work with states and working with states to provide, um, to help them be able to develop communities of practice to provide technical assistance to their districts and schools. So tomorrow, um, Joanne Cashman has a session, and she's going to go really into Oh, sure. Okay, is that better? Perfect, okay. 
So tomorrow, Joanne Cashman is going to be doing a session more specific to the IDEA partnerships model for communities of practice, which we use with the Ohio Department of Education, and I'm going to go over a little bit of it today. But she'll be able to give you a little bit more in-depth information about that particular model if you have any, any questions or I can kind of answer them um, here today if you have any that pop up. So what is a community of practice? How many people have been involved in a community of practice before? No. <laughs> okay, what about um, any online communities that you might have joined? Um, Facebook, Twitter, any other kind of social media? Okay, well, one thing um, when, when talking about communities of practice that I find extremely helpful, because it does get a little confusing, is one of my colleagues found this visual, and I know you can't see it very well, but on the conference website, uh, you'll have a link to this. And what this shows, and I love it, is online communities, when you say what is an online community, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and in particular, what I, what I found really great on this one is you have in the upper right-hand corner this northern wasteland of unread updates. So if you've ever tried to develop a community of practice or even an online forum or any kind of engagement online, how many times have you sent something and no one reads it? Um, another one that I thought was, was kind of cute is they have um, the sea of protocol confusion, which is kind of down in the middle to the right. And also when you're trying to develop an online community, people don't, aren't comfortable, they don't know how to interact with each other, so they don't know what to do. So you might say, everyone, we want to see your um, school improvement plans. You know, let's share and, and get ideas from each other. But if people don't know what they're supposed to do with those, how to post them, what ends up happening is nobody puts anything up and the conversation kind of dies. Um, there's the sea of zero comments, which as someone who's been working with us for a couple of years is a little painful because there are a lot of times when you're trying to um, really engage people in conversation and you think you have a great question and you think, wow, people are going to just jump on this. You have zero comments. And... It's just a lot of work to figure out what you, people need um, so that this can become an interactive community. And then one of my favorites also is the charred wasteland of abandoned social networks. So you might have been in a situation where you've tried something like this before and it kind of fizzled, didn't quite work out. And so you're a little hesitant maybe to try this again. And so this is just kind of a visual representation um, that I think is kind of fun. And if you're going to be working... Um, and developing a community practice at your school or district or state. It is something I think it's important to acknowledge that a lot of people think of online communities as a lot of different things, and they're going to come into it with either a lot of um, anxiety or just jumping on board wanting to do it and maybe even going a little too fast. So developing a community practice is really a lot of hard work. Um, and I think a lot of times... People have great ideas and they see the potential of technology and really want to use it, but don't quite stop themselves and spend the time to think through how do we really want to use it. Because the technology is the tool for the community, but it's not the community of practice. So in terms of what a community of practice is and what I'm, how I'm going to be speaking about it today, um, Etienne Wenger is really the the father of communities of practice. That's where the research base comes from. And he defines it as, as a group of um, people who share a concern um, or a, a problem or a passion about a subject, who, who work together, um, but they do something. Um, and I think that's one of the key pieces. And whatever this community is that you might develop, I'm going to be talking about a statewide community of practice, and I know we have district and, and school folks here, but it still applies to you. Um, and I'll try to make some of those connections as well. But it can be really big. It could be a statewide community. It could be a district-based community. It could be something that you want to, um, I'll be talking about Ohio in a minute. This is something that will be a multi-year community of practice. Maybe you just want something a little bit more short-lived and maybe it's a year, you know, three months. There's a lot of ways you can think about it. Um, the homogeneous or heterogeneous inside and across boundaries really speak to um, it could be within offices, across offices at the State Department. On a district level, it could be across departments. Um, even at a school level for a high school, it could be across departments. Or you could even have, you know, a community of practice and the history department. So, um, and then the homogeneous heterogeneous is really about roles. So it, teachers, administrators, parents, students, um, 
anyone really could be involved in it. And then in terms of how it's formed and kind of how, how structured it is, um, it could be either. It could be informal. Um, it could be something that, you know, maybe a group of teachers started it out as a lunch conversation, and it's turned into something where now they really want to have a, su a support and build this a little bit wider across the district. And so it could really start a lot of different ways. And when you're thinking about, um, later on we're gonna, during our activities, thinking about developing a community of practice for SIG implementation and SIG support, that's something you might want to keep in mind too, is how, what resources might you have, um, who could you get involved, and, and, and things like that. But really, so it could be a lot of different things, which I know is kind of daunting, but it really does need three things. It has to have something, a topic, has to have people, and the people have to do something. People have to do something. So a website is really, really great. If anyone's used SharePoint, I don't know. It's, a, it's a great for document collection and a document repository. It's really not great in facilitating two-way communication between the state district and school and their, and their stakeholders. So in, in that case, it might have a topic and it might have people posting, but if they're not doing anything, it's not a community of practice. So those are kind of the three things. No matter how you structure it, how you think about it, it has to have a topic, people, and it has to do something. So why use it? So there's a lot of advantages. Um, right now, technology is, is kind of an exciting tool that we have to really improve engagement, communication between, and again, I'm, I'm speaking from the state context, so I apologize, between the state and with um, districts and schools. And it's a two-way. And so one of the things that community of practice can in, can help with, or one of the advantages for using it, is when you have budget constraints, when you have time constraints, when you have staff um, constraints, you have, you have another tool, another mechanism to improve communication, to send information out, to really tap into external partners, associations, community members that can help you do your work. Um, by engaging all of these people, it, it does increase the sustainability of whatever your, your initiative is, so it's not really happening in a, in a silo, it's, open, it's opened up. It creates that two-way communication and feedback loop, and it really does help um, improve coherence of, of implementation. So I think over the next two days you're going to hear a lot about implementation fidelity. Um, and I think this is another tool possibly if you want to go that way in terms of using communities of practice to help you implement with fidelity, help you provide communications, um, information, and tap into the field to help you make adjustments along the way if you need to. Okay, so that was pretty fast. So let me talk a little bit about Ohio. So Great Lakes East has been working with the Ohio Department of Ed for the last three years to help them um, develop, adopt, and then implement um, a high school improvement policy called credit flexibility. That's what it's called in Ohio. But basically what it is is a, a policy that allows students to earn high school credit through demonstration. You kind of get moving away from, from seat time. And there's no restriction on the number of, of classes that can, um, on the type of classes or the number of credits that can be earned. So a student can go in um, to their, their school tomorrow and say, you know, I really think that I know um, all the content in, in English 12, you know, and, and here's how I'm going to demonstrate that I know it. And it's a, it's, it's a, they develop, develop a plan, an assessment plan, all of that is developed so that there is, um, it doesn't, it's not as simple as I just made it sound. But that's basically what the policy is, is that students can demonstrate proficiency and earn credit um, and kind of go on their own pace. So for some kids, they might need more than a semester to master, you know, course content. And maybe sitting in a class isn't the best way that they, they learn. So with, um, with this new policy and with the limited capacity in terms of, you know, they have 16, 614 districts. Uh, they all needed support at the same time. The policy went into effect across the board for all schools, all, all the subject areas, not just, um, elective courses, but also core content. So they needed, um, you know, they started to think about, well, how can we do this? How can we realistically do this? And only a handful of states have actually implemented the policy, a, a similar policy, New Hampshire, Oregon. Others have um, somewhat similar policies, but they haven't really gotten to the implementation point. So they were kind of also on their own. They didn't have the answers. And I think like you were saying earlier with SIG, you, not everyone, the answers have to come from everyone. Um, and there was a short implementation timeline. So they, it was adopted in 
uh, March 2009. It had to be implemented in 2010, 2011 school year. So there's a short time to get all of these moving pieces together, and there was no phase in. And so what they decided to do, um, and Great Lakes East uh, was involved, like I said, for the past couple of years, is to look for, for ideas and models of how they could provide technical assistance in a new way, in a way that would meet the needs of their districts and schools, but be, in some, in some cases, realistic in terms of um, their capacity. And so we, we looked around, because there are a lot of different ways a community of practice can be built and, and be created, and the IDEA partnership um, community of practice model is what they, what Ohio decided to settle on. And it was developed specifically for state education agencies, but it also has application to district and, and schools. Because what um, it's really designed to do is to engage stakeholders and real authentic collaboration and real work. Um, and they use a lot, you know, utilize technology to do that. And the other thing too, which came up in our conversations, is that for, for states, districts, and schools, this is a really a new way of doing business, and there's some anxiety in that. So at the state level, they, you know, we'd have conversations about, and with IDEA about, because they have about 33 states that work with them. You know, when, you, when I think sometimes, let me step back. So when I think sometimes of online communities, I think of newspaper sites and the comments people make on articles and how horrible some of the, the conversation just devolves into. And so one of the things with this model is that it's really um, created for, um, for district schools, like I said, um, and states specifically, to have a safe way to interact with um, the community in a way that is constructive. And over and over again, in the development of the community of practice and the communication methods, and we'll get into that in just a minute, um, that message has to go throughout the entire messaging of, of the community of practice, that this is different than a Facebook or a Twitter or any other kind of social media or online community that they might have joined. This is something that is, you know, to do real work and that it needs to be constructive. So on your tables, we are, we're going to do kind of a table activity in a few minutes. There's a couple different resources. Um, one of them is just a one-page handout from the IDEA partnership that describes communities of practice. The other two, there's a collaboration mapping tool and there's an action planning um, template. And really what these can be used for and what we'll use them for is to really start thinking through how you're going to develop and use your community of practice. Because like I think I, I said before, and I don't mean to sound like a broken record, a community of practice is something different than a website. Um, you really need to think about Who's going to be involved? How are you going to use it? What kind of work you want to do? Um, what maybe obstacles are there? Because what might sound like a really great idea, because you want to use like technology and it has a lot of potential and possibilities, it really needs to be also tightly facilitated. Um, otherwise, what happens is you do have those zero comments and you have the wasteland of unread updates and you have two people having that conversation back and forth, which really isn't what is going to give you the information that you need. So how to develop one. So you need to have a purpose. Um, it doesn't have to be you know, real, real specific, unless, that's the per you know, unless you're developing your community practice to do that. But you need to think about why is it good for collaboration and what is the objective of, of the collaboration. And again, we'll, we'll go through this in relation to SIG. You need, who are your partners? Who are you going to engage in the community of practice? Um, in the IDEA model and what Ohio is doing, they're really engaging everyone. Um, from parents, students, teachers, counselors, um, uh, IHEs. They're really trying to get as many people as possible um, into the community so that they can get those best ideas that bubble up to the surface. But you need to think about who are you gonna, who are you gonna engage and what would they be doing and what expertise, because it'll help you identify gaps as well. And then what is your current relationship with them? Are there people that you've worked with before that'll just jump on board, or do you need to do a little kind of pre-conversations with them um, to really understand what, what you're trying to do? You know, in initiating and engaging, how are you gonna go about doing it? Who's gonna do it? Um, obstacles. You know, what obstacles are there? It might sound like a great idea, but if no one has time to really help pull that together, that's gonna be an obstacle. Or if you don't have the technology, we ran into situations where you know, each district and school have a different 
capacity technology-wise. Some can do, have all the bells and whistles. Some really just need to have a phone line and they have a really hard time logging into a lot of, um, to some events. And so you have to think about what possible obstacles and how can you um, address them. And then after you kind of develop it, the, the really, the, one of the real challenges of that is to sustain it. So how do you keep it going? And so some of the things that, that Ohio talked about and, and discussed and, and looked at were communications. So once you've decided, okay, we have the topic and we can use SIG. Okay, so we wanna, we wanna have a community practice on school um, improvement grants and, and what we're doing with them. And we've identified who's gonna work with us and who we want to engage. And we, we've identified how we're gonna get people involved. And all of this is kind of these internal decisions and discussions that you'll need to have. Once you have all of that done, then you need to figure out oh, how are we going to message this and publicize it. Because again, people aren't used to doing work in this way, in, this, um, in an online community, in a community of practice, and so they're not really going to know. And you're going to have varying levels of people that are going to say, well, I've, I get on you know, the computer to check my email. Like my mom will get on once a night to check her email, but she is not comfortable yet doing other things online. And so but then you have my dad, same age, he's, he, he's great, he, he knows what to do, and then you have my seven-year-old niece who knows more than I do about the computer, and my phone, and she can teach me how to, how to use it. Um, so you're gonna have a, a bunch of different people, at different levels, and so you need to think about how you're gonna message it so that everybody understands what you'd like to do, how you're gonna launch it, how you're gonna explain, here's what we'd like you to do, how we want you to use it. And then engagement, how you're gonna keep people involved, um, what kind of feedback loops, how are you going to keep getting new people in, keep the people that are there engaged, um, continuing to work? And that also goes back to having real things to work on, whether it's helping identify in Ohio, it was helping identify um, what kind of guidance documents were needed and help us come up with those topics, help us come up with the specific questions that you need answered. So it needs to be work. And then you also have to have who's moderating because it can't fall onto one person and have it be sustainable. And ideally, in the community of practice, and I think it's great that, um, that the states are saying, we want to do, we have a great idea for a webinar, let us do it. Because that's what you want. Because you need to have the, all the community members start to be able to be in that moderator role, saying, here's what we need to be doing. And then I do have that thing up about shared norms. And that was real important to Ohio and to IDEA and the other states that they work with, and that this is... While this is something new and a different way to work together, there are specific expectations on how we're going to have our discussions. So constructive comments, no kind of snarky comments, um, no using text message shortcuts, because people might not understand those. Um, kind of asking questions in constructive ways. So they, and this was as, you know, as a team, as an internal team, they decided, well, here's some things that are important to us, and then it'll be opened up to the community to say, what else are we missing? You know, what else needs to be there? And then again, that action piece. So they need to be doing something. Otherwise, what you have is it's not bad. If, if, if you don't have the action piece, you can still have a really good tool, technology tool for information dissemination, but it's not a community of practice. And so you really need to have that action piece and figure out and have those discussions because you might find out after going through um, the conversations what you really want isn't a community of practice. It's a SharePoint site or a website or a listserv. Um, which is definitely okay, but you want to make sure that you go through all of these questions and think through them so that when you do launch, you know, publicly, that it's really what you want um, and it meets the purpose that you've identified so that you're not frustrated, that your participants aren't frustrated, um, thinking that they're going to have something else um, other than, than a community of practice. So I think we're going to do questions later, right? Or Okay. So I'll take some questions if you have them now, and if you could stand up and walk to the back, if that will work. Um, I have a question. Let me go ahead and speak into this microphone. Um, and I, I, oh, turn it on. So we've been engaging a community of practice, an online community of practice with state departments. And one of the things we discover, and maybe folks from the State Department in the room might comment on this, um, it, it is intended to be multi-directional and user-generated, and it's not a, you know, us delivering content. It's supposed to be about conversation and the generation of knowledge and that sort of thing. 
And so we want to have open discussions. And yet folks in state departments have literally been trained never to say anything publicly unless it's been approved by the higher ups. So it's been a real struggle for us to figure out how to make that work. And so some of what we've done is had some password protected spaces. I'm wondering what Ohio, is Ohio's fully public, anyone can get to it, or are there some private spaces as well? That's a good uh, question. They do have a public space where everyone can get to, but they also have the opportunity to have private groups. And I can pull it up real quickly. Um, and they can have as many you know, private groups as they'd like. While you're pulling it but, up, anyone yeah. from the State Department want to comment on, does it feel like you could join in a kind of public social networking site where anyone could see your comments, or would that be really dangerous? Or districts or schools. I mean, everyone has on your own level that kind of piece. I, I would say that it's dangerous, you know, from, from Michigan Department of Education, and that you get mixed messages. People will see that and say that that's what the department has you know, set as policy, and so then you have, you know, it's, it's hard enough to keep conflicting information from what come out from different people or offices within a department, but then when you put it public, then it's, you know, it's, it's, then it's, you, you approved it, essentially, was what some people will think, so I, I could see some real danger in that. Yeah, and that's something that Ohio and, and Great Lakes East and the IDA partnership talked a lot about because people do and they don't want to be seen as endorsing something. So for, for the Ohio example and credit flexibility policy, there were a lot of issues around who pays for this. So if I have a student that wants to take you know, a fine arts credit because they play in the orchestra in the evening and that orchestra teacher the, um, or, or the symphony or the conductor is going to oversee their learning, like, do I pay them? How do I cover that cost? And so there's there, and that has real implications legally um, for, for the state. And so they were very, very concerned and, and careful about how they message that and how they talk about it because um, they don't want to be seen as endorsing things. And so one of the things that they've um, done in terms of communications is really hit on the, this is you know, user-generated information, that ODE is supporting it, they they're want to provide a space for people, um, but that they're not going to be, the things that they post will be on the ODE website. So on the community of practice, there'll be links to things on the ODE website, but ODE won't necessarily use the community of practice site as the primary communication tool or where, where, that, where it'll house. So they're going to be using things like guest blogging and bloggers and um, frequently asked questions, but that is a concern. And that's one, um, one thing then in the development of their site that they decided is to be, have quite um, restrict, I don't want to say restricted, but anytime you want to post something or post a comment, it goes to a moderator to review. So then if they see that someone posted here's what we do, here's how we um, have addressed the school finance issue. If that doesn't meet, you know, really fit the requirements set forth by the state, they can then go back to that person and have a conversation and it doesn't get posted until it's, until it's cleared up. But that is um, definitely something that is, is different and, and a concern for states. If I could just follow up on that and ha could you go to Twitter? Yes. Um, again, we, we've been experiencing this with the uh, work we've been doing with the state departments and respect it and honor that and have, I think, a bit of a responsibility to push the envelope some. Can you search for Jason Glass? <laughs> so Jason Glass is the new chief state school officer in the state of Iowa. And um, there you go. He uses Twitter a uh, lot. <laughs> And I think it's safe to say that he's challenging his staff a lot as he uses Twitter. Okay, on the right, the, where it says people results, the second one down, Jason Glass IA. So this is, you can see what he's done so far today. So far today, we've got the whole first set of tweets. Keep going on, there you go. Now we're into still today. Now we're into yesterday. So this fellow is on Twitter all the time. And some of it is relatively benign. Why don't we, so hats off to kids and families for standing up to irrational last hired, first fired policies. Okay, well that's not completely um, benign. He's put his opinion out there, irrational. He's got a little link. 
Um, others are, um, I appreciate the leadership and courage demonstrated by NEA. Well, again, that's not um, benign. I mean, some of them are, I just was at North High School, go, you know, go Hawks kind of thing, which is relatively benign, but others of them are really putting out there a position. And he is really forcing the department and folks in Iowa to change the way they think about the nature of communication and and what's kind of coming out in these kind of social media sites. And I think it's valuable. It's hard and tough. And you're going to get into some, he's gotten into some tough spots, but he's also continuing to push that envelope. I wanted to ask the question that a woman mentioned that she'd been involved in a professional learning community. And I know there's some terminology in this world that I'm tripping over as well. So I would be interested to know what the differences are between a community of practice and a learning community and whatever other forms there are? That's a good question. Um, in terms, and I'm not a PLC um, expert, and again, the session tomorrow with Claudette Rasmussen, she, she's the PLC. But in terms of the communities of practice, um, it's really, in my mind, in the model that we chose, you know, I, I think it, it could be a community of practice depending on how the PLC is structured. But the model that we chose with the IDA partnership is it was specific to engaging external stakeholders and getting work, something done. So when I think of professional learning community or even online learning communities, it might be that you know we're learning together, we're coming up with, we're sharing ideas, we're, we are learning together, we, you know, lesson study as well. You know, you're doing things together as a collaboration, as a group. But the key distinction for the community of practice is that then what, what is that group doing together? What kind of action are they taking? What kind of problems are they solving? And if a PLC is structured that where they're doing that, I think then yes, it would be, it could be a community of practice. But in terms of some of the other, um, you know, a, a PLC focused on collaborative learning together, it's not necessarily a community of practice because you don't have that action piece or that practice piece. So like for me at work, we do um, book studies. You know, we have um, our group book studies and that, that's a learning community, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's a community of practice because we're not really taking that and applying that in, in, in solving a problem or, or working on an issue. It's more of just collaborative learning. So that's kind of where I see the difference. But a, a PLC could, could be a community of practice. Why don't we uh, take a, some time to do some work at your tables because we wanted to give you a chance to sort of engage in some of the, kind of, especially the cultural kinds of challenges that you might face as you try to think about new ways of organizing your work. And do we have the um, collaboration mapping tool on the tables yes. now? Okay. So um, in a second, I'm going to ask a couple of you to move around because we've got some table facilitators who really are there just to kind of help uh, keep the conversation going. We'll take about 15 minutes. And you have at your tables a collaboration mapping uh, exercise. And what we'd like to do is invite you to spend about 15 minutes together working through the questions. You know, kind of how would you answer it yourself? What do you think of when you're um, having to respond to the question? And if you can just process it out loud with a table, um, then we'll take a few minutes at the end of that to hear back. What did you come up with? What were your discussions about? And what we're going to do is split the tool in half. Um, and that way, one half of the room will work on the first three cells in the uh, table, and the other will work on the second three. And so that way, you'll have a little bit to share back. You won't have kind of made your way all the way through. If you're blazing through it, you can go through the whole um, table in the 15 minutes that we have. But we'd like to have you start just with the um, three, the three questions in a row. So what I'm going to ask, and let me give the directions for how we're going to do this before you actually move. So I think the best way, um, we want to have five tables. So ooh, two, four, yeah. Um, if this center table, if the whole table could just move over to here, then that would be great. We'll have this half of the room. And then you three, if you don't mind splitting up between these two, then we'll have this half of the room. OK? And what we're going to do is, if this half of the room over here can take the first three topics on that collaboration mapping exercise, anyone not have that uh, worksheet in front of you? OK, good. So you start with the first three and try to get through those three in your 15 minutes. And this side, the second three. 
and try to get through those in your 15 minutes, and then we'll share back what we heard from each other. Okay? And if, and if I can jump in, the reason, um, one, one idea is if you can think of this mapping tool as if you were going to create a community of practice for SIG. So when you're reading through the questions, kind of keep that in the back of your mind as well as what we'll do with the next tool is that we're trying to g give you tools that you could use today, but as well as take back to your district or school teams to kind of walk through the process. And so if you were going to develop a SIG community of practice at your, your, your school district or state, that's kind of the context for working on the, the handouts. Any questions about the activity? Okay, this table can move over here and this table can split up between those two and we'll go sit at one of the tables without a facilitator. And we've got the facilitator here and
Why don't you take about 30 seconds to wrap up your current thought and then we'll come back together. Okay. We wanted to hear a little bit about what you talked about. I imagine some of you started by just getting to know each other a bit and then hopefully made it to the um, exercise and were able to take a look at some of the questions. So let's see if we can get a little quick report out from the groups. Um, Again, I'm going to have to ask if you can speak into this mic. This is really awkward, but maybe I can move it up here. Let's see if I get tripped up. Um, let's have this half of the room uh, not, let's skip over the kind of contextual stuff you talked about and see, did anyone get to the questions that were on the mapping tool? Anyone? You want to share your conversation around that? Someone was being volunteered over here. Okay. Well, if you're going to define it through the community of practice, I think um, most people would agree in the room that if you're defining it through that, uh, it's just not happening to the extent of what that is. Um, there is communication between people, but this is exciting because it can really make um, communication better in a lot of ways, I think. Uh -huh. Did anyone have examples of the kind of communication you might want to engage through a community of practice? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, well, I just talked about how great it would be to communicate with other schools in particular that have received some of these monies and uh, just to see how they're implementing some of the programs and to see if they're effective. Just to have a, a medium to be able to hold these discussions because I'm finding that a lot of times I, I just have a perception of how things are working in my building but don't really know um, how they're working in other buildings and it would just be nice to have a, a way to communicate with other people to see how those things are working. And your example was, I thought, a good one about the, what the different roles were within your building? Um, yeah, we have um, some different people that have different roles, and sometimes we don't know, or as a teacher, I don't know if they're being, you know, if the people are really doing their jobs properly, and I'd like to see how they look at different buildings to see how they, to see if those people are, are doing their jobs effectively, um, and also just to see how people are communicating with those people. I feel oftentimes teachers don't know how to access the resources that are available, and the communication piece is kind of missing. So it'd be nice to talk with different schools to see how they're you know, kind of laying things out. So it seemed like a lot of this conversation was how a community practice might help facilitate some communication that needs to happen. Other comments on this side of the room about any of the um, prompts you were given? How about this side of the room? Did you, did you have a chance to get to the tool at all? Any conversation about what the prompts led you to talk about? Here we go. So one of the things that I noticed from the conversation here at this table was that there were examples of not only within building um, collaboration, but vertical collaboration, mm -hmm. where um, a, a school was receiving um, support for thinking about uh, what their goals were, setting their goals, um, and and monitoring themselves along the way. So it seemed like it, it was. I mean, the shared work was not only vertical, but uh, vertical, but horizontal. Uh -huh. So Good. I thought it, it was a great example. 
I think robust communities of practice provide space for multiple types of collaboration. Other comments, any general comments from the exercise? Yeah. Um, I just, I brought up to this table and I don't know if other schools experience this as well. I think this would be an excellent way to start to break out of that traditional thought of one, how the money's getting spent. Um, I work, the general, our, tra our administrator for this project, for the SIG school project, is very innovative. And so when we write proposals to the state to try to do more creative things, especially for the rural district that we work for, we get an apprehensive response. You know, that's not safe. That's not directly connected to math and reading. So I think by doing these communities, we can maybe help break some of that thought process mm -hmm. down a little bit to open it up, especially for funding issues. You know, we're struggling with finding ways to spend the money and the state's kind of like, we're afraid to, to let you do it that way uh -huh. because that may not be safe, mm. I guess. So using a community to open up practice. Yeah, one last comment over here. Come around. <laughs> um, so, oops, sorry. <laughs> so our group, um, you can, you can all tell me if I capture it right, um, but we really started, we really were engaging on how to um, make, create incentives for participation because that's so key. And some of the key areas that we talked about were, was this idea of um, horizontal connection, so m breaking people out of the walls of where they're, where they're at, if they're in a classroom or if they're in a school, to kind of make those connections. And we also talked about um, shared leadership as a possible way of doing that. So me allowing people or signing a role for people to take the role of being the respondent or the person who's managing the community for a week or a month or however you wanted to break it out. Um, and then we still, we had a lot of um, discussion about the, the role, the vertical connections and that role. And um, I know that one person here gave a great example of how um, they really just asked um, people what they wanted and created the environment and conditions to enable them to do what they wanted, but at the same time having a role of monitoring that process and everyone, because it was what they wanted and was, was on board with that, but at the same time we talked about a real challenge um, in that with the vertical, you know, the vertical connections it's not just that you know a state, for example, is you know dictating policy from the top down, but it's also people who the expectations of people in schools. Um, if they hear from the state, it feels top down because that's just the culture. Um, so thinking about ways to break that culture and giving people the environment and um, friendliness uh, or place to actually be free to generate new ideas rather than react to existing policies, for example, but, you know, having an ability to have some creativity. And there was an example also at the table where that even existed in a single school. They're just used to operating top down. So, um, you know, how do you change that? What are the kinds of catalysts? Um, do you create, you know, a coalition of the willing? You know, how do you do that? So we just, we had a lot more questions. Excellent. Very good. I think this idea of changing the nature of relationships and, and knowledge and information is central to the notion of a community of practice. All right. I want to shift gears if I can. I know some of you moved, and if you're comfortable staying where you are, if you've got all your stuff, stay there. If you want to move back to your spot um, where you have your um, work, excellent. We'll just stay right where we are. So the other thing we wanted to just give an overview for is another way that we're in the process of thinking about um, engaging a community of practice using a very rigorous and structured development process. And it's a research design and development process that we've been working on. Um, so just a quick background about our company. We're a small uh, consulting company that works primarily with state departments of education but other state education leaders, so governors, legislatures, state boards of education, statewide associations like teachers unions and administrator associations. These are the, the universe of folks that we serve um, and organizations that support them like the comprehensive centers, like the National High School Center and that sort of thing. Anytime we engage in actual work though, we want to make sure that we have at the table 
folks from every level of the system. So engaging folks at the district level is especially important to us because a state department really has to understand what's working at a district. Um, and similarly, folks at the school building level. So teachers, school level administrators, principals, assistant principals, and students are all folks that we try to engage in our work to make sure that we're understanding what it is we're um, wanting to do. And in doing that, um, we've engaged in two different types of communities of practice. The first one is probably much like what Ohio is doing and what we've been talking about, where it's really about interacting regularly around a common topic or problem or issue, and indeed interacting in a way to solve a problem. Um, and I'll give you a couple examples of how we've been doing that. The second one is what we're calling research design and development, where we really want to say, let's engage in the process of generating new knowledge and new models and strategies. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit. But just a quick background. So the State Consortium on Educator Effectiveness is a membership, dues-paying membership organization within the Council of Chief State School Officers. And uh, we kicked this off back in October, so it's still pretty young. Um, but we've got a collaboration site. And it's not a website. It's a collaboration site with the idea of getting that kind of multi-user-generated um, um, knowledge and information, doing webinars. We have a blog, discussions. We do have some face-to-face -face meetings. Um, and importantly, what we're about to embark on are our deep dive projects, where we'll have small groups of states that are wanting to work on projects of common concern. It's my hope and expectation that that will energize the rest, because I have to admit, it's been a struggle. We've had to really nurture engagement on this um, collaboration site. It's been, people are much more used to a website, where it's a one-way delivery of information rather than a common generation of information. So, our expectation is, and, and we had designed it this way, that when we get into the work of the deep dives where the state folks are literally working on projects together, the, the site will be much more useful to them, um, and hopefully we'll see that happen. The website is there, and you don't have this as a handout, but it will be posted on the um, site, so you'll have all the links and that sort of thing. So that's kind of like what we've been talking about so far. Now we've got another project that we're working on with the National High School Center around their early warning systems tool. How many of you are familiar with their early warning systems tool? OK, so this is a really powerful tool that's taken research and determined what are the indicators of, um, of a student's progress in high school toward graduation or dropping out. And so it's a tool where you can enter a lot of the key data about each of the individual students in a school, and then it will generate some early warnings to say, oh, this student's been tardy 20 times this try. Um, you no, no, notice this. This matters. The research tells us that this is an indicator the student might be on the path toward dropping out. And so in that, with that tool, um, which is readily available on the website, and again, we've got some links to it, um, we are talking within the high school center about creating a community of practice, which is essentially a kind of user group community of practice, much like the one um, up above, where folks who are literally using this tool in their schools, in their districts, and statewide um, would come together and talk with one another about how it's working, what are they doing, you know, sharing these kinds of knowledge and experiences and that sort of thing. So that's one arena where we're kicking off a community of practice. The other one is around um, this research design and development um, notion. And we are starting in Virginia. And um, it looks like we may engage another one in the state of California um, in a, a development process. Um, we're hoping then that folks will want to sign up and sign on and we'll, we'll be able to expand from there. So let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, the idea of a research design and development community of practice is that it's a facilitated network, and facilitation is going to be critical because there's some pretty quick and, and rigorous protocols that we use focused on rapidly crafting and refining solutions to local problems. So rapid, we have a series of 90-day cycles where we engage in rapid prototyping. Um, in order to come up with new solutions or to implement solutions that maybe don't have the research base that they're needed 
or even to take to scale solutions that have a strong research base but haven't, been, haven't gone statewide. So there's a, a number of measures along the way depending on what that solution is, but it's a solution to work on local problems of practice. Um, in addition to that, so for example, a local problem of practice might be that the students who um, transition from middle school to high school, um, we, we've noticed through our warning system that in that first semester, the students are coming to class, but in the second semester, they start dropping off. And so we know we've got a spot, we've got a problem that's happening in that transition, not only from eighth grade to ninth grade, but within ninth grade from semester to semester. So there's a problem of practice, we now need to develop a solution for that. So that would be the sort of thing this group would work on. Um, and then, in addition to trying to solve that for the particular schools that are in the network, we also want to be aggregating those results and to be um, engaging and improving the kinds of policies, the kinds of systemic changes that need to take place in order to allow that solution to take hold in the local sp space, but also in order to create the conditions now for that solution to go to scale. So um, just to give you a little bit of where this came from, um, Westwind and Knowledge Alliance, which is an alliance of research, education research organizations, such as the American Institutes for Research and, and organizations like that, um, we came together about two and a half, three years ago to start a process of really thinking about engaging innovation in education. Um, and through that and through uh, Knowledge Alliance's focus is in particular on knowledge generation and knowledge management, um, developed a design process that was supported by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Stupsky Foundation, and the Grant Foundation. Um, we also bring to the, the work at Westwind our framework for systemic equity leadership. And I won't go into it a lot. There's links here that you can um, find out about it. But we really draw on Peter Senge's work on learning organizations and systems thinking, Ronald Heifetz's work on adaptive leadership, on um, critical race theory and many of the theorists within that field, and grassroots organizing primarily out of Midwest Academy. Um, and I always add that last one because one of the things that the grassroots organizing um, underlies is this notion of a movement, of really engaging an entire movement for grassroots change. Um, the other influences are the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Tony Breich, who used to head up the Chicago Consortium for Public School Research, um, left that consortium to take over the leadership for the Carnegie Foundation. And in the process, when they hire for the Carnegie Foundation, they hire someone because of the agenda they have. And his agenda was to transform R&D in education, to say it must be a much more catalytic activity and an activity that more people engage in, this process of research and development. And so that he and Luis Gomez in particular have worked hard on coming up with um, a whole system that is much like what we've been working on uh, for continuous improvement and development. And again, their links are on here, and I'd encourage you to look at that. Um, all of us were uh, informed by Don Berwick and his Institute for Healthcare Improvement. They've got a whole process for engaging in research and development. And some of you may have heard or in your schools have learned about hand washing as being centrally important. This came out of the Institute for Healthcare Improvements research where they said we want to eliminate post-operative death by post-operative infection. And this was something that for a long time everyone just assumed this is the nature of the beast. You have an operation. It's a, a dangerous and difficult thing. Infections after an operation you just have to accept as being the nature of the work. And IHI said, you know what, let's not accept that. Let's just say we're going to get rid of post-operative infections. So they engaged this process of some plan, do, study, act, I'll share in a minute, of really looking at what are the practices that we have in our operating rooms and in our post-op um, facilities, and what can we change about those practices in order to get rid of infection. And they did. And interestingly, one of the things they discovered is hand-washing techniques made the difference. And so it's a, a relatively simple intervention that has had dramatic results. So it's that kind of thing we were like, let's see what kinds of things like that we can do in education. Um, the other thing we bring to it is the design orientation. So you notice I didn't say research and development. I said research, design, and development. 
And a lot of our influence was with IDEO, which is a design firm. They work with companies like Procter & Gamble to design the next toothbrush, for example. And they have a process, a very rigorous process of engaging in innovation. And it's not a willy-nilly, let's be creative and come up with wild designs for the next toothbrush. It's a very structured and focused process that is centrally located around getting new people into the conversation. And so that's something that we draw on a lot. And then finally, Dean Fixen and his National Implementation Research Network, which says anytime you design a project, design it so that it can be implemented and design it so that it can go to scale. And within that, they've got a couple of key um, activities and processes that make a great deal of difference to say, if we're going to do some work in, in a school improvement, with a school improvement grant with maybe one, maybe two, maybe five high schools, let's not think only about the one or the two or the five high schools. Let's think about the nation. So let's do what we do right in the beginning to do the kinds of things that we have to do to change the whole system. OK. There's a lot of kind of core understandings that I'm not going to go through with you, but the key piece here is that, that this is about rethinking where knowledge is located. And very much education struggles with one form of uh, delivery of knowledge, which is the expert sage at the front of the room delivering knowledge to the students in the class. And what we know is happening in now the way we're We've been talking about this for centuries and probably for th millennia, but we are again at a new place where we're beginning to rethink, or we're continuing the process of rethinking who owns knowledge and who can access knowledge and who can do something with knowledge. And so that's really central to this vision for using research and development as a way to change entire systems. Um, again, planning for scale, the, the basic idea is have every piece of the system present in the process. So when we do this work that we're doing around um, an early warning system with a couple of high schools, obviously we've got folks in the high school as part of that work. We also have folks in the district. We also have folks at the state level. Because we're going to find out when we're trying to do some dramatic change at the building level, there's going to be some kind of policy that's in the way. Or there's going to be some kind of practice that sort of halts our ability to go from one school to 50 schools. So we've got to have people involved in the process from the very beginning. And it has to be facilitated. Um, this is, in this particular format, we're really recognizing partly because of culture and partly just because we're trying to do this really fast. It can't be self-organizing. There has to be a facilitator who understands the process and helps the, the groups work through them. So the quick components of what a collaborative learning community or a, a, a um, community of practice around research and development would look like is we've got to have some research sites. We've got to have, in this case, with the early warning system, some schools that are willing and ready to take part. Um, within those schools, then, we need interdisciplinary teams who engage in this work. We're not going to just get the principal. We're not going to just get the principal and the teacher. We're not even going to just get the principal and the teacher and the guidance counselor. Now, that's a, you're getting a pretty good team when you get there, but we're also going to get students. We're going to get members of the community. We're going to get folks from the district. And we're hopefully going to get someone who comes to this from a completely different perspective, an anthropologist, a journalist, someone who's coming at this work not from the center of our field, but really from the outside. Um, and then we've got to have a development process. We, we have protocols that folks work through in order to um, do their rapid prototyping, in order to test them out, and then ultimately to take them to scale. So the quick idea is these plan, do, study, act phases where, and I took this right from the Carnegie Foundation site, so you can go there and, and look, where we, we spend our first bit of time looking at what's going on. And in this case, we've got this system that generates data for us. So we pull that data together and we look at what are the patterns we're seeing and what are some of the potential causes of the patterns that we're seeing. And from there, then, we can develop a hypothesis. Well, I bet if we did something different in first period in the second semester, we might recapture those students, and they might, might not continue being tardy, for example. And so then we say, let's try something. Let's see what the research says is already out there, or if nothing's out there going to hit what we want to do, let's create something ourselves. And then let's put it in to place for a short period of time, 30 days, and then let's review what happened. Let's take a look at the data and analyze our results. 
and then refine it. Did it work? Did it get where we're going? Did it not? What kinds of things did work? What kinds of things didn't? How can we readjust it and then go through the process again? So the idea is you do this whole process in 90 days. Now, unfortunately, that might mean in a school setting, 30 days in May, 30 days in September, 30 days in October. You have to kind of go with the schedule and the calendar flow. But the key is to keep it focused and to keep it moving. Um, and then the idea of this is, so we've got, in, in our case in Virginia, two high schools with their districts and their state that are coming together. They're the intensive sites. That's where we're going to do the first series of cycles until we get something that seems like this is really making a difference, at which point we can then take it to more high schools. And in the state of Virginia, they've got a, a new um, accrediting criterion that's going to matter a great deal to high schools. So we've kind of got a ready-made group. You might think of school improvement grants, high schools with school improvement grants, kind of a ready-made group that might be interested. Oh, those two high schools did that. I want to try that. So now they become the beta test sites. And they engage in the same process to kind of make sure that the peculiarities of the small intensive sites weren't what made it work. And then take it to large scale adoption. And here now is where we envision a community of practice much more like the one we've been talking about, where now we've gone from a small number of intensive sites to the entire state or the entire nation. We still need that ecology of information flow and sharing and collaboration as people engage in the intervention. And so because of that, then um, what, what West Wind and Knowledge Alliance were pressing largely before now I'm with the National High School Center, I'm pressing to say we have to have some organization that takes responsibility for this, for creating these conditions to share this information. And these are the kinds of things that an organization, um, in this case, I posit like the National High School Center would be doing to keep this going. And so it ends up being like this. You'll have an organization like the National High School Center, like the US Department of Ed, that recognizes the patterns of problems that states are facing. And then they ask for a set of intensive sites. They go to the school improvement grant recipients and say, we're seeing this kind of problem. Would anyone like to be involved in a cycle of uh, rd and Get some of the work going here. Find some solutions that we then take to a broader group to beta test. And then when it's all done, we've now got a network where we can take these um, activities to scale. So that's the grand idea. Um, there are a couple of conditions that we think need to be present and that we've been learning from the Carnegie Foundation. They've been doing this in the field of developmental mathematics at the community college level. So the Carnegie Foundation pulled together a group of folks at the community college level to say we've got to do something to change developmental mathematics so that students actually persist through community college to an AA degree. And they've run now a year and a half's worth of these cycles to um, get to where they're going. And these are some of the conditions that we're finding really need to, make, to be present. Um, this information about the Virginia Early Warning System is up on their site. Uh, the tool is up on the National High School Center's site. What we're doing is a kind of traditional TA to get them using the tool, give them technical assistance for it, and then when it comes to the place where they're saying, what are the interventions we're going to do now that we've discovered patterns, that's where we're kicking in our rapid prototyping cycles. So we've got two very different high schools in Virginia, um, and hope we're, we're, I wanted to be farther along, but because of testing and spring breaks and things like that, we're 30 days into our 90-day cycle. So we'll have more information at the end of um, September when we uh, gear back up and get them going. Um, and this tells just a, a quick bit about what we do in each of those 30 days. So now <laughs> we are looking for high schools that might want to join either type of community of practice. Um, either a community of practice where you're just literally using the early warning system tool and want to talk with other schools and districts and states that are using the tool. So that's kind of one community of practice we're going to organize. And then another one will be, as we're ready to go and beta test some of the stuff that comes out of the early Virginia work, we're looking for other schools and districts and states that would like to be involved in taking what they've been seeing and engaging that work. Or someone who wants to say, well, I want to get in on the ground level. I've got some innovative ideas I want to get started. We, we can run multiple of these cycles at the same time. So you should have at your table 
a half sheet of paper that says, um, I'm interested in finding out more. It doesn't commit you to anything, but if you want to find out more about either of these communities of practice that we're generating around the early warning systems, um, please fill this out and turn it in so that we can let you know what's happening and what the schedules and what it might take to get involved. And then just so you know, when you go to the website um, for the conference, I've got the links for all the different organizations that we mentioned and then our contact information. Okay, I kind of let the table discussions go a little long, so that was a quick, very fast review of um, another way of thinking about organizing a community of practice. So I think the main hope is just as you think about this as a way that you can do your work, there's lots of different things you can try to do within your communities of practice, and there's lots of knowledge and information about what does work um, in an online community, in a virtual, a face-to-face -face community, and that sort of thing. So be sure to stay in touch with Tori in particular because she's got a lot of experience to be able to share with you about technically what do you got to have as your infrastructure. All right, any questions, comments, thoughts? I know it's a whirlwind, but we're out of time. So great, thank you very much everyone and uh, we hope to stay in touch.